Hi, first grade scientists. This is Mrs. Miller here with our very last lesson of this science unit. Today in lesson 15, we'll be talking about how humans copy animal adaptations. But what are animal adaptations? Have you ever heard of that before? Let's say this word together. Adaptations. That's a long word. Can you stretch it out really slowly with me? Ready? Adaptations. Let's do it just a little faster. We'll read a little bit faster. Adaptations. Very good. Now, let's just read it smoothly. Adaptations. Very good. So adaptations, animal adaptations, are those things that help animals to survive or stay alive. You remember how we learned that animals and plants want to stay alive. So remember we even sang that song, staying alive, staying alive, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, animal adaptations help animals to stay alive. And we're going to learn all about the different things that animals do and the different parts of their bodies that are adaptations that help keep them alive. So let's see what our friend Dr. Jeff has to say about this topic. Check it out. I spotted a hummingbird near the bird feeder. Ha! Look at that, Zoe, you're right. Look at it drink from the feeder with its long, skinny beak. Isn't it cool how hummingbirds have such unique-looking beaks? That's called an adaptation. Oh, Dr. Jeff, you're really out of focus today. Oh, that's better. So a bird's beak is an adaptation? That's right, and it helps it survive in its environment. I'm Dr. Jeff Vinegar, and today we're going to explore the science of adaptations and the environment. We'll learn that animals adapt to their environment. We'll explore adaptations that help animals protect themselves. And we'll discuss adaptations that help animals obtain food. Welcome to Labrakazam, where we make science make sense. So who can tell me what an adaptation is? Like a movie that's based on a comic book? Oh man, I love those things. Four new ones just came out this week. Not those kind of adaptations. In the world of science, an adaptation is a characteristic of a living thing that helps it survive in its environment. So a hummingbird's beak helps it survive. How? The hummingbird beak, which is long and skinny, allows it to reach deep inside flowers. Once it's in there, it can drink nectar by curling up its special tongue like a spoon. Whoa, Dr. Jeff, there's so many different types of birds with different types of beaks. Are all of those adaptations too? They sure are. Let's break it down. Birds have all different kinds of beaks based on their environment and the kind of food they eat. Like finches, who use their small beaks to eat tiny seeds. Pelicans, who use their large, pouch-like beaks to scoop up fish. Or hawks, who have sharp, hooked beaks to eat small animals like mice or lizards. But adaptations aren't just limited to birds, are they? Nope. All kinds of animals have adaptations. I think we should go check some more out. It's time for a... Field trip! Today, we're at the world-famous Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay. It's in Florida, and they have over 12,000 animals. Now let's take a look at one of my favorite animals. It's a giraffe, and they have some amazing adaptations, like this tongue. Look at that. Gabe, tell us about the giraffe's unique tongue. It's a very, very long tongue. 
uh, 16 to 18 inches from the back to the tip. The tongue is really, really long because what they typically eat in the wild has thorns all over the branches. So what they'll do to avoid those thorns is they'll take that really, really long finger-like tongue, wrap it around the branch, and then pull. That does two things. It bends all the thorns back, and then it pulls all the green off the branch. Uh, another interesting thing, the tip tends to be dark. It helps with sunburn because their tongue is sticking out 16 to 18 hours every single day when they're feeding. So those are adaptations that help them survive. Definitely. Why are their necks so long? They're able to reach a lot of food sources that other animals out on the Serengeti Plains can't reach. So let's say there was a fire, which made all of the grass and small shrubs burn away. Do you think the giraffe would survive with only the tall trees? I think the giraffes would survive because they have such a unique adaptation. But the other animals wouldn't. What would they do? In that case, uh, animals would get out of the way. They're pretty smart. So when they see a wildfire coming, they get out of town. That's right. When the environment changes dramatically, some animals die, others move to another location, and some animals develop adaptations over generations that help them survive. I'm here with Trevor, who has a degree in biology, and he's a zoo educator. He is an armadillo. Tell us about it. So this is Oli. Oli here is a southern three-banded armadillo, and he is very excited because we brought some snacks with him today. So I think we're going to take a knee and let him chow down on some of what we brought. Now, Oli is a very unique type of armadillo. You can see all over his back, he has these really tough armored plates. Those help to keep him nice and safe from any predators that might be around in the area. Is it true they can really roll into a ball? Now, most armadillos actually can't roll into a ball. Oli here is one of the few armadillos, though, that can not curl up fully into a ball and lock his head and tail completely against one another and make a solid sphere. And they'll do that whenever they feel that there might be a predator around. When hunters go after these types of armadillos, they just curl up into a ball, and it does make them easy to capture. So there you have it. The armadillo has an amazing armor that helps it survive. Let's look at another animal. Our next animal is a sloth. It also has amazing adaptations, and Aaron has one right here. Aaron, why are sloths so slow? Sloths are so slow because of the diet that they eat. These guys only eat leaves, and leaves don't have a lot of nutrients in them. So because of that, they don't get a lot of energy from the food that they eat, and they move really slowly. What adaptations help them move in the trees? So these guys have really long arms and some big claws, and that helps them hang on to the tree limbs, and they hang upside down pretty much their whole lives. What adaptations keep them safe? So if you look at the sloths fur, you can see what interesting camouflage they have. This would really blend in very well to a tree. They can often get algae that grows on their backs, and that helps them blend in as well to the treetops. Also, they're really slow, and when they don't move, it's hard for predators to see them. So their coloration and just being really slow all helps. So there you have it. The sloth has unique adaptations. Its claws help it hang and climb trees. It has a slow metabolism, which means it can eat leaves and move really slowly. It also can allow algae to grow on its back to blend in. All of these different adaptations help it survive. survive. Labrakazam. Our next animal is called an echidna. Well, this is Darwin, and these guys are called short-beaked echidnas, found all the way over in Australia. So they have some very unique adaptations that help them to cope with living in such a harsh environment like that. What adaptation helps them find their food? If you look at his snout, he has a very elongated nose. He has a very unique adaptation in their snout. They can sense where food is based upon electricity. They can actually find their food just like a shark can by sensing the electrical movements created by ants and termites. What adaptations do they use with their tongues? So just like an anteater, they use their tongue to get inside ants and termite mounds, twisting and turning, making U shapes and all sorts of other different shapes to find their food. Has any adaptation occurred with their feet? Well, there's been quite a few. If you look at his feet, he has these very large, powerful feet, just like those of a mole. So these animals love burying themselves underground because they can help keep themselves nice and cool whenever it gets too hot out in the deserts of Australia. So the unique snout helps it find food. The unique spines help it defend against predators. It's got all these adaptations which help it survive. Now let's check out some animal adaptations in our everyday lives. It's time for some real world science. Animals that adapt to the environment aren't just those that you see in the zoo. Some common house pets like Sophie the dog here have also developed adaptations over time. 
For instance, dogs have developed an extremely good sense of smell, nearly one million times more sensitive than humans. This allows them to sniff around for food as well as smell territories that have been marked by other dogs. House cats, like their wild relatives, are hunters who operate mostly at night. Their eyes help them see in the dark in order to spot their prey. Cats also have claws they use to climb, hunt, defend themselves, and destroy our most cherished furniture. Deer have adaptations to help them survive against predators. They have extremely strong leg muscles that allow them to run up to 30 miles per hour. This helps them outrun predators like wolves and coyotes. Even small animals have special adaptations for survival, like lizards who have tails that can break off when grabbed by a predator. Humans have their own adaptation too, like opposable thumbs. This means your thumb is placed opposite of your fingers on the same hand, which allows people to grab things in ways that most animals can't. Now I'd like to see a hamster do that. Now, let's check in with Zoe with some do-it-yourself fun. Today, to demonstrate the adaptation of bird beaks, we're going to test which is the best kind of tool for grasping seeds. For this investigation, we'll need a pair of grilling or salad tongs, a pair of medium-sized tweezers, and a pair of needle nose tweezers, some peanuts still in the shell, sunflower seeds in the shell, and some sesame seeds. First, make sure the seeds are all in three separate piles on your workspace. Let's first try to pick up the biggest object here, the peanuts. Let's try the smallest tool first, the needle nose tweezers. How about the medium tweezers? Now let's try the tongs. Success! The tongs are similar to the beaks of larger birds of prey, like hawks and eagles, which use large, powerful jaws to catch small animals like rodents or large insects. Now, let's test the sunflower seeds. The sunflower seeds are too big for the needle nose tweezers to pick up. Let's try the tongs next. How about the medium tweezers? These tweezers are similar to the beaks of a seed-eating bird, like a finch or a cardinal, which have short beaks well-suited for pecking seeds. Finally, let's try to pick up a sesame seed. We only want to pick up one seed at a time, first with the tongs. How about the medium tweezers? Now, let's try the needle nose tweezers. Labracazam! The needle nose tweezers work like birds with long, narrow beaks. You can try other variations like different sized foods or other types of tools to simulate the many adaptations of bird beaks. Try it yourself! Thanks, Zoe! Now, let's review. Today, we learned that animals adapt to their environment. We observed that adaptations can help animals protect themselves. And saw how adaptations can help animals obtain food. What did you guys think of the field trip today? I thought it was awesome. I love seeing all the different types of animals and their adaptations. Speaking of adaptations, check out this new and improved nectar-sipping robot. From now on, you can refer to me as a hummingbird. <laughs> Anyone mind bringing that flower a little bit closer? Sure thing, Hummingbird. <laughs> Join us next time on Labrakazam. I'm Dr. Jeff. I'm Izzy. I'm Zoe. I'm Hummingbird. Remember, always question, always, question, always wonder. We sure did learn a lot from Dr. Jeff about animal adaptations. Can you try to name three different animals across your fingers? and their adaptations and how those adaptations help them to survive. Ready, set, go. All right, time's up. Let's see how you did. Were you able to name three? Yeah? Awesome. If you were able to name three adaptations, I know you were really, really paying attention during that video. So I'm going to share the three that I came up with. There were so many, but 
One I remember learning about was the giraffe, right? We see him right here in, in, on the screen. So giraffes have very long necks, which help them to eat leaves from very tall trees. So that's an important animal adaptation that helped giraffes to survive. Um, another animal adaptation that I was thinking about was the sloth. Sloths, although they move very, very slowly, they're able to climb trees because they have very long arms and very sharp claws. They also are able to camouflage themselves from predators and blend in with the tree so that predators don't see them and eat them. That helps them to survive too. And then dogs. Yeah, even like your pet dog. Dogs have and dogs have animal adaptations too. So um, in the video, we learned how dogs have a very strong sense of smell, and that can help them to easily find food or sniff out territories where other animals have gone. Now we're going to listen to a little bit of this book. It's called How to Swallow a Pig. It's written by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. It's sort of a silly title for this book, right? How to Swallow a Pig? Like, what is that all about? But as we listen, we'll learn why the title of this book is How to Swallow a Pig. And we're also going to learn about an animal adaptation right now. So listen very carefully. After we listen to this part of the book, we're going to think about how humans use the same adaptation in their lives, how they copy the animal's adaptation. So listen very, very carefully. Here we go. How to Swallow a Pig by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. So, you want to learn how to swallow a pig? You've come to the right place. Follow these step-by-step -step instructions and soon you'll acquire the dining skills of a large snake. But maybe you're not quite ready to gulp down a hairy four-legged animal. Don't worry. There are lots of other useful techniques you can master. After all, you never know when you might need to spin a web disguise yourself as a jellyfish, battle a sheep, or catch a wildebeest. Just take it slow and remember, practice makes perfect. Number one, how to trap fish like a humpback whale. A humpback whale is the size of a school bus and can, can consume thousands of fish in one meal. Whales are mammals, so they breathe air. This allows them to catch fish in an unusual way with a bubble net. If you'd like to try it yourself, here's how you go about it. Step one, find some fish. The first step is locating a school of fish. Some of these schools include millions of herring or sardines. Step two, tell your friends. Call any humpbacks in the area and let them know you've located dinner. Step three, slap the surface. Whacking the water with your tail frightens the fish and makes them swim closer together. If you don't have a tail, ask one of the whales for help. Step four, swim in circles. Join the whales in circling beneath the fish while blowing a steady stream of bubbles. Herd the fish together by swimming in smaller and smaller circles. Step five, gulp. Take turns swimming straight up through the cluster of fish. Open your mouth wide and swallow as many fish as you can in one gulp. Wow, so humpback whales are pretty amazing animals, aren't they? It's so incredible how they use an adaptation to help them to catch fish, right? Weren't you amazed by how they slap the water to scare the fish so that the fish all gather together and then they swoop underneath the fish and suck them up into their mouths. Look at this, how they do that. That's so incredible. Can you think of a way that humans copy the humpback whale? 
and kind of like copy their adaptation. Can you think of a way that humans do that? I'm going to show you a video right now that shows just how humans copy the humpback whale to catch fish too. All right, so check this out. This method of fishing is called cast net fishing. Watch how this fisherman mimics or copies what the humpback whale does to catch fish. So look, he throws his net in. Watch how it slaps the water. Just like a whale's tail would slap the water, right? So now you can picture the fish underneath being startled and grouping together, right? Now watch what happens next. You'll get to see the, the, uh, the net slap the water again. Now watch what happens. So now he's able to pull that net back up with all the fish inside of it. Pretty incredible, right? When he pulls it back up, the net acts almost like the whale's mouth, capturing the fish as he pulls it up. Looks like somebody's going to be having a delicious dinner tonight. Before we go on to learn about more adaptations, we're going to do some brainer size with Mr. Catman. But first, can you remember an adaptation that cats use to help them survive? See if you can name one. Whisper it into your hands. All right, let's see if you remembered both animal adaptations that a cat has. Dr. Jeff told us about two. One is that cats are able to see in the dark to help them to hunt their prey at night. And also, cats have very sharp claws. That helps them to defend themselves. All right, now stand up. Stand behind your chair, push your chair in, and we're going to do some brain a size with Mr. Catman. Now, let me just tell you, these brain sizers, brain -a sizes are harder than they look. Good luck. Brain a size with Mr. Catman. Shoulder rock and roll. Meow. Mr. Catman is doing his robot dancing. Slick. Roll your shoulders forward like Mr. Catman. Next, roll your shoulders backward. Meow, let's combine the two. Roll one shoulder forward and roll the other shoulder backward at the same time. You got it? Roll one shoulder forward and the other shoulder backward at the same time. Pawsome. Awesome. Meow, switch sides. Roll your opposite shoulder forward and the other shoulder backward. If you can't get it, no need to have a catadoo. Practice makes perfect. For real. All right, everyone, you can have a seat. It's time for some more learning. So we're going to continue reading part of this book, How to Swallow a Pig. And in this section, we'll be learning about how this animal repels insects or keeps insects away. I want you to think about, as we listen to this part, I want you to think about what we as humans do to repel insects or keep insects away. Is it something that maybe we learn from this animal? Ooh, this might be handy coming into the summer. How to repel insects like a capuchin. Capuchin monkeys live in the rainforest among lots of mosquitoes, flies, and other biting insects. Insects can make a monkey's life miserable, but these clever primates have found the ways to protect themselves. If you want to follow their lead, 
here's what you do. Number one, get together. Capuchins make their insect repelling sessions a social occasion. You can join in. Step two, grab a millipede. Some millipedes defend themselves by excreting poison through their skin. The powerful chemicals they produce also repel most insects. Step three, pop the millipede in your mouth. Ugh, this burns and it tastes terrible, but rolling the millipede around with your tongue encourages it to release its toxins. Step four, rub the millipede on your fur. And be sure to share your millipede with any monkeys that don't have their own. Step five, crush some piper leaves. The leaves of the piper vine also contain chemicals that repel insects. If a millipede isn't doing the job, or you can't find one, try crushing a few piper leaves and rubbing them all over your fur. Now you're protected against those pesky insects. All right, humans. So... We do not take millipedes like the capuchin does, roll it around in our mouth to release the poison and then rub it all over our body, right? Yuck. Who would want to do that? We also don't take piper leaves and rub piper leaves all over our bodies either to repel bugs. But we have this same problem that the capuchin monkey has. We don't like bugs on us. We don't want bugs biting us. So what's something that we do that's sort of similar to what um, this monkey does that repels bugs? Hmm, can you think of something that we do? If you can think of something, whisper into your hands right now. I wonder if you thought of what I was thinking. Whenever I go into the woods, I make sure to spray bug spray on myself. So those same types of scents that are in the squished up millipede or in the piper leaf can be found in bug spray and that helps to keep insects off of our bodies. Pretty cool. Now we heard a little bit about the armadillo from Dr. Jeff. Let's learn some more about the armadillo and the adaptation that the armadillo uses to protect himself. Animals come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Some are big and furry, others can be small and slimy, and some even have a full suit of armor, like our friend Gaia the armadillo. Armadillos look a little like a mouse or a rabbit, but there's something that makes them really special. They're covered in hard, bony armor on their backs, heads, and sometimes their tails. You're right, armadillos do look really cool, Squeaks. And their armor is more than just cool looking. It also has an important job, protecting the armadillo from anything that might want to eat it, what we call predators. There are over 20 species or types of armadillo, which live in different parts of South America, Central America, and some places in North America. Some species of armadillo are huge, like this giant armadillo. It can be around a meter or three feet long. That's about as long as a three-year-old human is tall. Other armadillos, like the pink fairy armadillo, are tiny. They're about 10 centimeters or four inches long. They're so small that I could fit one in the palm of my hand. And yes, their armor is pink. Gaia is a southern three-banded armadillo, which are a little bigger, about 25 centimeters or 10 inches, around as long as a piece of paper. But even though there are lots of different kinds of armadillos, they all have a few things in common. First, they all have their bony armor to keep them safe. Things like skin and fur are pretty soft, so a lot of small animals can be in big trouble if predators that want to eat them get too close. That's why they tend to run away and hide. But armadillos have an added layer of protection to keep themselves safe. That's right, Squeaks, they have their special armor. Armadillo's backs are covered in thick plates of bone with a layer of tough, small scales on the outside. The scales are made of the same stuff that makes our fingernails. And the scales have a fun name, 
They're called scoots. With all those scoots covering them, armadillos kind of look like little knights wearing suits of armor. That armor acts like a shield, keeping the armadillo's soft underside safe if a predator tries to bite it. Three-banded armadillos like Gaia can even curl all the way up into a little armored ball. That would be pretty hard to bite. Another thing all armadillos do is sleep underground because it keeps them cooler when it's hot out and because it's safer. Even for an animal with awesome armor, Armor, it isn't always safe to sleep out in the open. If an armadillo is asleep, it might not notice a predator sneaking up on it. So armadillos sleep underground in a home called a burrow. Some armadillos use burrows made by other animals, while some make their own. To make a burrow, they use their big front claws to dig through the dirt, creating a long tunnel that leads down to a bigger room. Some armadillos will also make extra tunnels leading out of the burrow, so they have lots of choices for how to get in and out. Armadillos spend a lot of time working on their burrow because they need them to be a great space for safe sleeping. And they need to sleep a lot, up to 16 hours a day. Once they've gotten enough rest, armadillos crawl back up above the ground, then dig around eating plants, bugs, and all sorts of tasty foods perfect for a little armored friend. So armadillos like Gaia are pretty well prepared for whatever comes their way. Their armor and burrows help keep them safe in a big world. If you were an armadillo, what kind of armor would you have? And what other animals do you want to learn more about? Have a grown-up help you leave a comment down below or send us an email to kids at scishow.com. These are pretty amazing creatures, these armadillos. So think about the adaptation that the armadillo uses. What's the adaptation that the armadillo uses to help it to survive? It's covered in armor, right? I guess that's how it got, it got its name, armadillo, right? Because it's covered in armor. Can you think of a way that humans also use armor to protect themselves? Hmm. Whisper into your hands. Three, two, one. Okay, I wonder if you were thinking what I was thinking. I was thinking about knights. Yes, think of our Harley Knight, right? Knights cover themselves in armor, in a special armor to protect themselves during battle. All right, now I want you to go off and I want you to watch this video it's called Animal Hide and Seek, and it's all about how animals use camouflage as an, adapt as an adaptation. Do you know what camouflage is? Hmm, I bet you do. Camouflage allows animals to blend in with their environment so that they can't be seen by their predators or by their prey. So you'll learn about different ways that animals use camouflage. As you're listening to this video, I want you to think about ways that humans also use camouflage. All right, so right now, pause this video, and then I want you to press the blue button up in the top right-hand corner to listen to and watch this video on how animals use camouflage. When you come back, we will spend some time talking about how animals use camouflage and ways that humans also use camouflage. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back, first grade scientists. Can you now think of two different ways that animals use camouflage? Think of two different animals and how they camouflage or blend in with their environment and how that helps them to survive. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. I want you to turn and talk to the person next to you. If you're at home, talk to a family member or your imaginary science partner. If you're in school, talk to someone sitting, sitting right next to you. You have 20 seconds to talk about this. Ready, set, go.
stop, look and listen. So were you able to come up with two different ways that animals use camouflage? Hmm, here's what I came up with. Deer and mouse, and mice rather, they both blend in with the forest floor and that helps to protect them from predators so that predators are not able to spot them. Then I was also thinking about how sharks camouflage with the water that they're in. The top of their body is blue so that when you're looking down, you don't see them. And the bottom, their, their underbelly is a lighter color. It's like almost white, which helps them to blend in when you're looking up at them, right? It helps them to blend in with, with their surroundings, with the sh sun shining through the water so that they blend in with the water around them. And that camouflage helps them to sneak up on their prey so that they can eat. And now it is time for our activity sheet. So if you're at home, you'll find this in your Google Classroom. If you're in school, your teacher will give it to you. Let's read what it says. It says, we have learned that some animals use camouflage to blend in with their environment. Draw an animal that uses camouflage and write a sentence to tell about it. So you'll do that first. Then on the second page, it says, draw an example of a human using camouflage to blend in with their environment and write a sentence to tell about it. Can you think of a way that a human uses camouflage? Hmm, stop and think right now. Touch your head when you have an idea. I have an idea. I know that when people go bird watching, they might wear camouflage clothes so that the birds don't see them and the birds will come cl up close and they can get a better look at them. Can you think of another way that humans use camouflage? If not, you're welcome to use my example as well. All right, it was so much fun learning with you today. Be on the lookout for those animal adaptations. They're all around you. So interesting. Stay curious, everyone. Bye-bye, first grade scientists.